uh, just the roller coaster of emotions when you go through Jacob. I, I love those old stories, Jacob. I love the story of Joseph. I, I love all those things. They're just up and down, just so many high points and low points, and, and it's just amazing. But we're going we're gonna to start here tonight, verse 24. It says, And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. Now, if you're like me, there's a lot of, uh, you know, I, I don't know, uh, Cliff could probably tell us tonight uh, how you're supposed to lay out a story, and it's very important to make specific uh, mentions of people. But when you read this, it just says there's a man that comes up, they're fighting, and then it just says he. Well, there's two he's in this story. And a lot of times when I read this, I would think, well, he prevailed not. You would think if you're, you're wrestling with an angel that you probably are the one not prevailing, right? But, but in this fact, it's actually the angel talking about this and saying the angel's not prevailing. And so it said in verse 26, and he said, let me go for the day breaketh. And then he said, this being Jacob, he says, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. This is such an important time in all of humanity. Even if you don't believe this book, even if you, you, don't, you want to cast away everything that has to do with God, this gives us the description about how a nation, Israel, got its name. Amen? And so we find he said that thy name shall be no more called Jacob, but Israel, for as a prince... Hast thou power with God and with men, and has prevailed. Amen? Can you imagine being able to have that name, bear the name Israel? And in, in, in this translation, in the King James, it says that you have power with God and with men. Other translations, of course, talk about this. You have struggled with man and God. You have wrestled with man and God. And that's actually what Israel means. If you go look up Israel, it means wrestles with God. Amen? Can you imagine having a name that you have wrestled with God and that you have overcame that. And we know the history of Jacob. We know everything he's went through. We know that he tricked his own dad. And we know the story about how he also got tricked by his uncle Laban. And all these things, the history behind everything that Jacob has become up until this point. And then he gets himself alone and he wrestles with God. And I believe this is the turning point in the entire Old Testament narrative. I believe in this moment, God as a chosen people. In this moment, he lays a name down on this generation, on this group of people. And he says, you are going to be my people. And I'm changing your name because you've wrestled with me and you have prevailed. Amen. Amen. You've struggled with me and you have prevailed. Amen. The struggle. The struggle is what I want to talk about tonight. And that's my message. Uh, the title of the message tonight is The Struggle is Real. Amen. The struggle is real. I was thinking about this and, and, and this whole idea of suffering and all these different things in the Bible. You know, that suffering is all over Scripture. And, and uh, I was thinking when I was a kid, I used to really, really love wrestling. I mean, I, I loved it. And, and now I watch it and I just, I laugh at how silly it is. But man, when I was a kid, I used to love it. And I can remember... Uh, I can remember Hulkamania, you know. I, I was one of those Hulkamaniacs, you know. And, and I remember watching him, and, and he would be in a wrestling match, and, and those guys be beating his face in. I mean, and, and they'd be hitting him and elbowing him and throwing him around the ring. And I, as a kid, you know, you're thinking, wait a second, he is the Hulkster. I mean, he's supposed to be giving the beating, not taking the beating. But it was all it was all a setup, right? It was all a show. And, and, and so Hulkamania would be getting hit in the face, and, and you're just like, well, I just didn't see this coming. And you start getting worried, and you start getting stressed a little bit. Like, he can't lose to this guy. There's no way. But then what would happen? All of a sudden, the fans would start cheering, and the, uh, all the Hulkamaniacs would go wild, as he likes to say. And all of a sudden, you could see him start to listen. And, and matter of fact, he would he would do that where he's listening even closer, you know. And all of a sudden, he would start shaking, you know. I don't know if Hulk Hogan's ever been to a Pentecostal church, but I mean, he's missing a great opportunity to be a Pentecostal, if not. And, and he would start shaking, and then the louder the crowd would become. And then all of a sudden, I, I can remember, you 
know, some of these big guys, Andre the Giant, who could just smash anything with one hand, he'd hit him, and, and Hulk Hogan would just look at him and shake it off, you know, he'd just shake it off, and he's like, hit me again, is basically what he's saying, hit me again, he'd try to hit him again, and it was just like this, this infusion of the Hulkamaniacs had just somehow put a force field around him that nothing could, could hurt him, and it was just, I, I just remember seeing it sometimes and thinking, how in the world can a man like Andre the Giant hit you in the face, and you say you want more of that, you know, I just don't understand, and, 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 and then sometimes you read scripture, and you see people going through certain situations, and it kind of reminds me of that same mentality of like, are you a glutton for punishment, like, you, do you actually like this type of stuff, and, and, and I'll, I'll read some of this that, that kind of makes me feel that way, you can read a lot of it in Acts, and all throughout the New Testament, the New Church, but in Acts chapter 5, there is a story that just every time I read it, I think, Wow, it's amazing. In Acts chapter 5, starting verse 40, to, to finish out the chapter, it says, And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, the apostles did, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Amen. They took a beating and then rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer for his name. And I've read this before and thought, my goodness, how different that is from a lot of us. Well, well, let's flip over just a few chapters here. I think it's in, yeah, it's in Acts 14. There's another story in, in verse 19, and it says, And there come thither certain Jews from Antioch and Achenium who persuaded the people, and, 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 and they say, And having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Right? They thought that they had killed Paul. They thought that they had stoned him to death, and they drug him out of the city. And in verse 20, it says, Howbeit, as the disciples stood around him, he rose up. It was a different kind of Hulkamaniac. He rose up and came into the city the next day and departed with Barnabas to Derby. And when they had preached the gospel, he preached the next day the gospel to that city and had taught many. They returned again to Lystria and to Achenium and to Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. They thought he was dead. They thought they had stoned him to death. And the disciples dragged him out from, the, from amongst all the people, supposing him to be dead. And the man Paul stands up. He stands up and he says, what are y'all looking at? Let's go preach it. The next day he goes and preaches a sermon. I'm here stressing about working all day and then coming to preach. I didn't even get stoned to death before I came here. What a shame for me. But Paul went through all of this and still preached and then has the audacity standing up. Who knows what he looks like? I mean, you can imagine how bruised he was after people thought he was stoned to death and he has the audacity to look out into the congregation and say that you are going to face tribulation if you want to make it to the kingdom of God. I mean, can you imagine? I can stand up here and tell you that you're going to face struggles and you're going to face tribulation, but not like a man who had just been stoned to death can. Amen? That's why Paul was so persuasive because because he had lived through the struggle and he was able to talk about it. Amen. Amen? I, I can't imagine. I, one of my biggest fears when I get to heaven is some of these great giants of, uh, uh, of, of, of the new church are going to look at us and say, you are a bunch of spoiled, rotten babies is what you are. It's what you are. You don't even know what it's like to be persecuted. You have no idea. You think it's rough on Facebook? You think it's rough on Twitter? You, oh, I'm sorry, someone hurt your feelings? You know what it's like to be stoned to death? Amen? I, I could just see this type of talk, but you've got to imagine where Paul is coming from. And that's one reason I love reading the New Testament, specifically the letters of Paul. Because Paul, he doesn't care what you think about anything. He tells you like it is. And he tells these people, he said, listen, Jesus told me for a fact that his grace was to be sufficient for me. And he says, as a matter of fact, my strength is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul would go on. He's writing this letter in the second letter to the 
church at Corinth. And he's writing this letter. And then he says one of the most audacious things that you can read and try to perceive. Paul says, therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. He said, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Amen? Yeah. Can you imagine? Maybe you would think when Paul is saying this that he may have been hit upside the head too many times with a stone, right? Maybe maybe one just right to the temple got you and maybe you're not thinking clearly, Paul. But Paul is saying, listen, I take such great pride. I rejoice when these things happen to me. And why is that? He says, because when I am weak, then I am strong. Yeah. And we read this and, and it's great and it's great, a, a great verse to remember. I highly encourage you to remember that verse. It, it'll do you wonders in your prayer life. It, it's a great reminder to God that you know, and it's a great reminder to yourself to know that when you are weak, you can be strong. And, and that's what Jesus said. He said, my, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Amen. But what I really love about this verse, if you go and you look at the actual translation, the words there that we use for strength and for weakness, they're a little bit different than what we just read in the Bible today in the King James Version. That version of strength that Jesus is talking about, it is your own strength. That version that Paul's talking about, he says, when I am weak, that weakness is our own version of weakness. It is, it is how much I can bench press. It's how much I can squat and deadlift. That's my weakness. And, and, and that's, that's the word that's used there is my weakness. But then he says, so when I am weak, then I am made strong. That word strong is not my strength. It's not how much I can bench press. It's a strength that is given to me. It is a strength that's handed over to me. It doesn't belong to me. It's not what I have worked for, but it's what someone has given to me. And when I read that one day, I thought, my goodness, that verse has a whole nother meaning to me now. Because he says, for when I am weak, then I am given strength to overcome whatever it is that I'm going through right now. You got to understand, Paul was stoned to death. Paul was put in prison. Paul was spit on. He was made fun of. He was beaten multiple times. He was killed. And for all this, for preaching and believing in Jesus. Amen? But time after time after time in his letters, he said, it's worth it all. It's worth it all. You have to understand, church, it's worth it all. And almost every letter that Paul is writing, the, the reason he's writing the letter is because people are being affected by the preaching of Jesus and the believing in Jesus. People are losing their family members. People are losing their friends. And, and all of this is happening all because of the name of Jesus. And in an effort to, to help hold down the crowd, in an effort to really pull everyone together, Paul would write these letters and he says, yeah, I know your brother just died. I know they just killed him because he believed in Jesus, but I'm telling you it's worth it. Yeah, I know that so-and-so just got put in prison because they were preaching Jesus, but I just want to remind you, stay the course. It's worth it. Yeah, I know that we're being beaten right now. Stay the course. I know they don't want to hear our doctrine. Stay the course. Oh, if there's ever a letter that we need to write to the Christian church today, it's yes, we may be persecuted. Yeah, we may have problems. Yeah, there may be things that come into our life. But if there's ever been a time that we need to stay the course, right now is the time that we need to remind ourselves it will be worth it. Amen? It will be worth it. It's in the struggle, not where I find my strength, but where I find his strength. And thank God it's not just our strength. Thank God that it's not upon ourselves that we have to find some strength that we have. Thank God it's a strength that's given to us from God himself. You see, until you are willing to confront the struggle, you will never see the hand of God move in your life like you want him to move. Until you are willing to confront the giant, you will never see Goliath fall. Until you are willing to confront Pharaoh, you'll never be able to hold a stick up in front of a Red Sea and see it split in two. Until you are willing to confront the group of people and say, we're going to walk around the walls even though it seems silly and it seems ridiculous. Until you're able to convince those people to walk around the walls, you'll never see them fall. You'll never be able to walk out of a fiery furnace until you're willing to confront Nebuchadnezzar and all the strict rules that he had. You're never, you'll never be able to walk out out of a lion's den until you refuse to quit praying when they tell you to quit praying. Sometimes we got to remember that in order to see the hand of God move like it did in this book, that we have to be willing to confront our struggles. Amen? I, I, I don't know about you, but sometimes I get so tired of, of just reading about stories. I think we can be a story. 
And, and, and man, I, I'm telling you, my parents, I thank God for them every day. And, 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 and some of the stories that I have heard over the years, that I, I mean, they are staples in our family. And, and I've heard of stories of, about Saltville, Virginia. I don't know if any of you even know where Saltville, Virginia is, but that's where my parents were from. And I, I've heard many stories of, of those old time revivals and, and where they would bring out the sawdust and, and just folding chairs and people would come from all over just to hear some sermons and people would preach. They would have weeks worth of revival, amen, weeks worth of revival. And, and, and I remember not too long ago, I went to the Billy Graham, Billy Graham Museum, amazing place you've never been there. It was just so amazing. And, and I remember going through there and seeing that some of those revivals he held for, were for weeks at a time. And, and, and you think, man, uh, uh, some churches are struggling right now to have any revival. And they were able to have revival for weeks at a time. Well, what an amazing moment that must have been. And, and, and I hear all these stories. And, and sometimes I'll go to a church today. And, and, and there's a church not too far from here. And I, uh, and, and I went there one time. And they said, oh, Kevin, if you would have just been here 20 years ago. Man, some of the services we used to have then and 20, 20 years ago or so. And, and I heard all these great stories. And, and, and sometimes as a younger Christian, I, I remember telling my mom and dad one night, they were talking about something. I said, stop. And they said, what's wrong? And I said, I'm tired of hearing about the stories. Why can't we still experience the stories? Why can't we still have a move of God? Why can't we still, if it was the tabernacle that we brought out, if it was the sawdust that we need in the tent, then let's bring it out. Let's set it up again. If that's the recipe, then let's follow the recipe. But I think you and I both know that it didn't have anything to do with the sawdust. It didn't have anything to do with the tent. It was about the condition of people's hearts. It was about the problem. Priorities in our life, wherever we have to do to get back to that place, let's get back there. Amen. 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 I'm so tired of hearing about it. I want to experience it. Amen. I want to experience it. But in order to do this, I believe that we have to start confronting our struggles. Jesus says something very peculiar. He says a lot of peculiar things, I guess, but but there's something. You know, there's a few things that Jesus says that just make you pause and stop and kind of reevaluate everything. Uh, one of these for me personally is Jesus makes it abundantly clear that you are not to say anything bad about the Holy Ghost. You know, uh, on multiple occasions, he says, you can say whatever you want to say about me and it'll be forgiven you. He said, but don't you dare say anything bad about the Holy Ghost. And he goes on to say, it won't be forgiven to you in this world or in the world to come. So very clear. There is no gray area. You just don't do it. And then there's another thing that Jesus says that's always perplexed me and always made me think very hard about this. And that is this notion of carrying a cross. Matter of fact, in two different contexts in, in Scripture, and various Gospels record this in different ways, but they're very similar. So, so that makes it even, even better that there is no misinterpretation about this. And in and, and one context, when he's talking about carrying a cross, in Matthew 10 and 38, Matthew records it that he says it like this. He that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. In Luke, the same context, same type of conversation, Luke records that same thing as, whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. That's pretty jarring. It's pretty jarring. Then the second notion of him talking about carrying your cross, Matthew records it like this in, in, in chapter 16, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Mark 8 says, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Luke records it, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. There, there's, no, there's no insertion of words here. There's no opinion that you can take. It, it's very clear what Jesus is saying. He's saying there's a very clear distinction and very clear importance on taking your cross up every day. Matter of fact, he says, if you're not willing to take up your cross every day, then you're unworthy of me. It's those types of things that really jar me and really make me want to make sure I know what is being said. I want to make sure that I'm worthy. I, I, I want to make sure that Jesus thinks I'm worthy of following him. And so that begs the question, what does this mean? Does that mean we, we go five us across? We cut us one out? We just start carrying a cross around? I don't think he means this physically. I don't, I don't think he means this in that sense. So what does this mean? What, what is the cross referring to? Well, if you look at the cross and everything that it means, it, it means quite a lot. I mean, I, you, could, you could preach a whole series just about the cross and everything that it entails. So that's a little bit much to digest, but there's one part particular about the cross that I can't get away from. And, 
And that's that, this idea of suffering. The idea of suffering that it represents. And not just the suffering that it represents, but the, but the notion that, that Jesus accepted it voluntarily. He, he accepted it voluntarily regardless of its intensity. Yes. I think it's very important to understand that Jesus did not have to die on the cross. He had the choice. But he decided to voluntarily. He did this out of his own free will. And I'm telling you, there was a moment when he was in the garden. And you can tell that he was stressed. And you could tell this was on his mind. And he was, he was sweating as great drops of blood became to, uh, started to come down his face, the Bible tells us. And he says, God, if there is any way that this cup can pass before me, God, please make it so. But he said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Yes. This was him volunteering. He signed up for this. He knew exactly what was about to happen to him. He told people as much. He told the disciples. The Last Supper, he takes bread and he breaks the bread. And he said, this do you in remembrance of me. This is my body that will be broken for you. This, this wine, this glass of wine, this is in remembrance of the blood that I am going to freely give, freely shed for you. He knew what was going to happen. This was not just some coincidence. This wasn't a shock to Jesus. He wasn't shocked when all, all the religious leaders said, we want you to crucify. That was not a shock. That had been prophesied for years and years now. He knew what was about to happen to him. Yes. But he took it. He accepted it. And I believe that is exactly what he is talking about to each one of us when he says, you have to bear your cross. What does that mean, Kevin? I think that he is saying you have to be able to accept your struggle. You have to be willing to look at your struggle, look at your suffering in the face, and willingly accept it. But know the whole time that in your weakness, my strength is made perfect, and you'll be fine. You're going to be okay. I'll be with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. But before you can understand that I have an endless supply and an endless amount of strength to give you, you've got to be willing to bear your cross. You've got to have the faith to put the cross on your back every day and just know that I will be there. Amen. 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 I, I, I think it's just, you can't help but just thank God so much and thank Jesus so much for being able to, to pay that price for us. Amen. He didn't have to do that. But he volunteered and he did it regardless of the intensity. Regardless of the intensity. He knew he knew how bad it would be. I, I've read some, some commentary on this that said that Jesus lost every drop of blood he had in his body. Because when they pierced him in the side, water came out. They said the fact that water came out shows you that he did not have any blood because once you start losing blood, your heart starts to beat really fast and it pumps every ounce of blood that it can to the core of your body. And the fact that they pierced him in the side and water came out shows you he had no more blood left to give. Every single drop he had, he gave for us. Not just a little bit, every single drop. And he did it voluntarily. And he, here's the other thing about Jesus that I think is just so amazing. He was God, he was deity, but he was also a human. And a lot of times when we go through our struggles, what's one of the questions we ask, at least I do? God, where are you? Where have you gone? Now, I just want to remind you, there was a moment on the cross where Jesus had the same type of idea. Remember when he was stretched out on the cross? And he looked up and he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Yes. Hey, man, can you imagine? I can just imagine what was going on in God, in, in Jesus' head in that moment. I bared my cross. I've done everything you've told me to do. I am the spotless lamb. I didn't deserve this death. I didn't deserve any of this. But I'm doing it for these people because of the love we have for these people. Jesus is God. He is a part of the triune Godhead. He knows the Father. He talks to the Father daily. He knows the Holy Ghost. He talks to the Holy Ghost. They communicate daily. He knows this. But even Jesus in this moment said, God, why have you forsaken me? Maybe we shouldn't feel so bad all the time about saying, God, where are you? I think that's part of the wrestling that we are in with God. I think that's what Jesus is saying. you got to be willing to pick up your cross every day. Not every day is going to be great. Not every day is going to be roses and sunshine. Not every day God is just going to pour down blessings upon blessings. But every day you're willing to carry your cross. You're willing to look your, your sacrifice 
Christ in the eye and say, I accept this. Amen. 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 I, that's why I love the story about Jacob. Jacob, his name was turned to Israel. Amen. It means those who wrestle with God. And it, 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 it's amazing to me, though, that Israel, the nation, is known as the chosen people of God. So, so it's not a far leap to say those who wrestle with God are the chosen people of God. What does it mean? What's it mean to wrestle with God? Well, I, I don't know if you know this, but we are constantly wrestling with good and evil. We're constantly wrestling with sin and holiness. And, 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 and you might say, well, Kevin, I, I, I'm saved. I, it, even if you're saved, sin is a temptation. Amen? Amen? Sin is always beckoning you. Sin is always trying to get at you. Even Jesus, the most perfect man that's ever walked the face of the earth, even sin came beckoning to him. In the wilderness, the devil tried to tempt him three different times. And in those times, Jesus said, it is written every single time. He quoted the word of God. He quoted back scripture to the devil. And, and so we find that we have a recipe for for, for avoiding this, but to say that sin no longer has an effect on you is false. That's an ignorant statement. It, as a matter of fact, I think the, the more that you draw closer to God, the more Satan would love to sift you out, and the more he comes and, and, and tries to find ways to tempt you out of, out of the kingdom of God. So we are constantly in this wrestle. We are constantly wrestling back and forth with God. And I think that's what Jesus is saying here. If you truly want to be my disciple, if you really want to follow me, then this is a necessity. You've got to be willing to wrestle. You know why I think this church isn't full tonight? Because people aren't willing to wrestle anymore. You want to know why I think church attendance is probably not where we want it all across the board? It's because people don't want to wrestle anymore. If we read something that we don't agree with, that is wrong. We never even take a second to think maybe, just maybe, my thoughts are the ones that are wrong. And this scripture that was divinely prepared is correct. I don't know how many people I talk to about scripture and they say, I don't know how you can believe that. And I say, well, I mean, that's a fair, fair statement. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in here that's pretty wild. But, but I'm reminded of what Billy Graham said. He had a friend who was kind of pulling him a little bit away there for a while, who turned atheist, one of his great friends who was a, a former evangelist just like Billy was. And he said that he took a walk in the woods one day and he set his Bible down. I think it might have been on a tree something, I'm saying, but he set his Bible down nonetheless and he just started talking to God. And he said, God, there's a lot of things in there I don't understand. There's a lot of things in there that are just out of my realm and I, I don't get it. But I promise you to always have faith to believe that it's so. And that's where I stand. There's a lot of things in this book that I probably wouldn't have done that way. But I want to tell you, we're a few thousand years removed from the culture of this day and time. And we're also talking about a deity who's never not existed. An alpha and omega. The beginning and the end. Uh, to, to suppose that we could ever interject a thought that would be contradictory to something so high and magnificent of God in heaven. It's a laughing matter. <laughs> it's a joke. And, 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 and so people, it just boggles my mind how we can get to a place where if we don't agree with it or it doesn't meet the, the day, today's times or it's not culturally relevant to me today, then I'm just going to shut the book and proclaim that it does not have any good and any use for me. I told you the other day I, I, I was listening to a guy who said that he, he studied the Bible as a literary work. Not as a scriptural guide, but just for the, the, the pure literary elements of scripture. And he said that every time I think I get to the bottom of a story, every time I think I figure out the meaning of a story, I unravel ten more layers. He said this book never ends. He said the metaphors keep going. The, the, the resources and the advice for life, they keep continuing. I've never seen a book like this. And I'm sitting on the other side of this video thinking, that's right. That's because it was divinely inspired by something that's not a human. It was divinely inspired by the power of God. It knows no end. It is the living word. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall stand forever. Amen. 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 So I want to ask you tonight, are you willing to wrestle? Are you willing to wrestle? It indicates you're here to contend. 
And I believe very strongly that that is what God desires of us, that we are willing to contend. If not, he would have programmed us to be robots tonight. If not, God could have just created us all to be followers. I, I think back at Nazi Germany or, or some of those armies where they're just marching hand and foot and you just think, what a corrupt mind and they're all brainwashed and all these different things. God could have programmed us to be very much like that. God could have programmed us to be that way. Matter of fact, angels. Angels are created for a purpose. And I've probably told you this before, but the way I always remember it, it seems that there's, there's word-bearing angels and worshiping angels and warring angels. I always remember www. They got like a website, I'm sure. www.angel.com or something. I don't know. But anyway, that, that's the three categories I always think about. And every single angel was created for a purpose, right? Even Lucifer was created for a purpose. He was a worshiping angel. And, and, and the Bible tells us that he would get in front of the throne of God wherever it was at that time. And he had a garment of praise. And, and when, the, when God would come out, the glory of God, Lucifer means to reflect God's glory. And Lucifer, with his garment of praise, with all these jewels and things on, he would get, he is known as the spinning angel. He would spin and God's glory would be reflected. And, and I, I just imagine that every, all the other angels and everything, and, and the Bible also says he had the ability to produce any type of musical instrument out of his being. I, I looked it up one time. Any, any instrument you can find in a symphony orchestra, Lucifer had the ability out of his being to produce that sound. It's absolutely amazing. But he was created for a purpose. Even Lucifer was created for a purpose. But you and I, we are created not for a purpose, but for a choice. Yeah. You ever thought about that? He didn't, he didn't program one. You have the choice of whether or not you want to come to church or not. You have the choice of whether or not you want to praise him or not. You have the choice of whether or not you want to open up that heavenly book or not. You have that choice. You're not built for a purpose. You're built for a choice. And I thank God tonight we got people that came to a revival and you're here and this is the choice that you've made. I believe that you're going to be very thankful you made this choice as well one day when, you, when you're in the streets of gold with me. Amen. Oh, but, but we are built to contend. That, that's our whole nature is to contend. I get cracked up sometimes when, when, when I talk to people about their marriages and, and they, you know, everybody wants a happy marriage. You know, i got to be careful. Tasha will probably watch this later. But anyway, everybody wants a happy marriage. And, and I've got some friends, and they're just like, we never fight, ever. And I'm just like, that is such a lie. Like, there's no way. And even if that's the case, you guys, that's a boring life. I mean, you want someone you can contend with. You know, and I know it's not obvious to start with, but, but in reality, you do. You want someone you can contend with. You want someone that makes you better. You want someone that pushes you. I mean, if I married someone who just told me how wonderful I am all the time and, and how great and how right I am all the time, I mean, I'd probably be okay for a few months, but, but after a while, after a while, you'd probably get tired of that. You want someone that pushes you. You want someone. You married this person. And wouldn't it be a shame if you actually agreed that they might have a good perspective on your life? Amen. Oh, wow, that'd be amazing. You want someone that pushes you. You want someone that you can love. And you want someone you can respect. Amen. Mm -hmm. Same thing with your job. You want a job that pushes you most of the time. You want a job that pushes you. It challenges you. It makes you better today than what you were yesterday. Constantly pushing you out of the comfort zone. If you didn't, you would just you would never grow. You would never grow in your skill set. You would never grow in your intelligence. You would never grow in your experience. If you just did the same thing day after day after day, you want something that pushes you and motivates you. It's the same thing with our Lord. It's the same thing with God. That's why it's so great. That's why I can say today, that I'm a better man than I was yesterday because God is constantly pushing me. God is constantly urging me. God is constantly putting me out of my comfort zone. I never thought in a million years I'd ever be behind a pulpit. I never thought this was where I was going to be. But God has a way of constantly pushing you and, and trying you and trying to get you to go further than you ever thought you could go. And one day you'll be the one holding a stick in front of a stick expecting the sea to split. Right. Right. You imagine? I, I've thought about that so many times. If God told me to grab a staff, go out to the Atlantic Ocean, and hold it up and expect it to split, everybody and their brother would be like, Kevin needs to go see somebody. I mean, that, is, that guy's nuts. <laughs> right? You know, imagine, imagine if I was out on a boat. Imagine if we went fishing. Brother Ronald, imagine if we went fishing, and there was a storm that came, and I stood up, Stop! I, you would laugh your head off probably unless you're like, well, maybe he is. Maybe he's got something going here. Touch him, Jesus. Yeah. But can you just imagine 
what that looks like, what that feels like. It, it seems so foreign to us because, you know, they say that you'd be too heavenly minded to do any earthly good. I think a lot of us are too earthly good to do anything heavenly good. The supernatural, these types of things, I believe, you know I'm shut tight. I believe that there is coming a day where we will be forced out of our comfort zone. I believe there is coming a day where we will see these types of miracles, where we will see these types of actions. We don't see them today. Why? Because no one is willing to bear their cross and stare their struggle and go where God is pushing them to go. Amen. And I believe we're going to see it. I truly believe. I've heard so many stories. Oh, man, the Wesleys. Hey, man, I, I remember one time, I, I can't remember which one it was, he preached a sermon about hellfire, and he preached it, and they said the people in the, in the, in the congregation could literally feel the flames of hell on their feet. Uh, there, there's a man, uh, uh, is it Tommy Tinney, I think it was, who was preaching one time in a pulpit split in two, amen, while he's preaching. I believe we can see these things. Ever since I was a kid, I have had this vision, I've had this moment, you know, my shut, and I believe one day it's going to happen, and I, I probably told you about this, but I was reading the story about Moses and how he had been in an encounter with God, and when he came down from the mountain, he had a glow about him so strong that they actually, they didn't have to put a little mask on him. They put a big mask on him to cover him up because the glow was so strong on him. And I'm telling you, I believe it with everything in me that one day we're going to be in a revival service. We're going to be in some meeting somewhere and we're going to leave. And when we leave, the people that see us will say, what in the world has gotten into you? What is on you? What is going on? And the only answer we will have is that we have been in the presence of God. Amen. Amen. Not too far from here, Newburn. Newburn, Virginia at one time. I believe that they had a revival service or a service of some sort. And the people passing by the church could see smoke coming off of the top of the building. Amen. The police went. They said, we heard there's a fire. We heard something's going on. And they said, no, we're just having a really good service tonight. Amen. I believe we can still see these things. 